listen, I don't know what your week has been like. I don't know if there's been pressure and turmoil and busyness, but right now the God of all hope and the God of all peace is holding out his peace to you right now. Just receive. Listen, you are accepted in the beloved. You are accepted in the beloved. You're already living forever as his child on this earth. His peace. Jesus said, my peace I give you. My peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives. His peace. That peace that passes all understanding. Oh, receive his peace right now. Receive his love. Perfect love casts out fear. Receive that love now in Jesus' name. Someone even is receiving a healing in your body that you've been asking for a long time. And right now, right in this minute, both in this room and any, there is no time in the spirit right now where you are. Receive that healing right now in Jesus' name. Oh, the healer walks among us. Hallelujah. The healer is in you. The kingdom of God is in you. Receive his healing now. Ooh, hallelujah. Well, you can be seated. Glory to God. Hallelujah. This is fasting season. I've never heard so little fasting teaching. But in a way, I, I think that's okay, especially on a Wednesday night, because truth be known, I'm looking around the room. I know most of you for a long time. Most of you have, at this point, had so much teaching on fasting. Yes, I'm looking in the back. I'm looking everywhere. I think all of you could probably teach a seminar on fasting. So in this, uh, this year, it's not a matter of lack of information. Dare I say it? No. <laughs> so I'm not going to ask, how's your fasting going? Hallelujah. <laughs> Someone said it's going out the window. No, that's not. Hallelujah. Do something. We're in January. Of course, it's really the first quarter. And, and now Nathan, Nathan says, it's all year. Oh, we forgive you, Nathan. No, we love you, Nathan. <laughs> Hallelujah. Do something. Every, I've, I've committed now, listen, it, you know, I'm, I'm doing something every day this month. Not every day a total water fast. Some days a total water fast. Some days a puh, vegetables only fast. Some days a 16 hour fast. Some days something, but do something. If your flesh isn't mad at you today, you're not doing it right. I know I'm doing something right, because trust me, my flesh is unhappy. And that's a big part of it. Now remember this, nobody that I have ever heard of in all my years being around here has ever died from fasting. Your body tells you you're going to die. The truth is, what takes you out of fasting is your emotions. And fasting really is a good boot camp thing. It's a thing you can do on purpose before you get on the front line. To start taking control, showing, I like how Sue says it, emotions, body, you are not the boss of me. See, Smith Wigglesworth used to say that. He said it a little different. He says, I don't ask Smith how he feels. I tell Smith how he feels. Well, that's where we're going. Amen. Before we get started, and I want to leave this on the message, all of that. Uh, I'm not at liberty to talk about this yet, but we had an inc I had an incident that happened this week that uh, I've had time to reflect on. It's not, not something that happened to me or with me. It's just something, an encounter that I had. I'm telling you my appreciation for the new nature has never been stronger. If you can hear the voice of your conscience... You need to thank God that you're born again. And I've never quite seen so clearly. It's, it's Christ in you. It is, it is the Lord's and it is the very nature of God. And it's the most precious thing you have. 
Take my money. Take my car. Don't take that nature away from me. And now I am so, because of this encounter, even more so. Listen, I don't ever want to violate that nature again. The longest day I live. I, I have been repenting ever since. I've been repenting for a day or two. For all of the times that I knowingly, don't tell me you don't know, that I knowingly overrode that new nature. God, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry that I trampled on such a precious gift that Jesus paid such a price to have. Father, I don't ever, I don't ever, ever want to violate, not even in a little bit. I don't want to ever violate that new nature. I probably will, but I don't want to. I don't want to ever again. And it was made so clear to me, so clear to me. If you have it, well, you, could worship, you could never worship God enough just for the new nature alone. That's what's going to get you to heaven now. I mean, following that nature. And if you have it, let's just, let's just worship him just for a moment. Just, Father, thank you that I'm born again. Father, thank you for the new nature. Father, thank you. I know right from wrong. Father, thank you for writing in my mind and in my heart your law so I can know you, Lord. And I know what to do. Father, I thank you. Help me. I, I never, ever, ever want to violate that new nature again. Lord, I don't ever want to do it again. Never. Not on anything. Not on any level. I don't ever want to violate it again. It's so precious, and Jesus paid such a price for me to have it. Lord, I apologize for all the times I've just trampled on that nature. I know I have. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, God. But Lord, I repent. This is a repentance prayer. By your grace, with your help, I'm going to do my best to never ever, not one time, violate that new nature again. Never. In Jesus' name, and if you agree with that, you can say, Amen. Amen. Boy, it is something precious that we have. Well, open up in 2 Timothy and put a marker in Luke, 11, uh, excuse me, Luke 14. I'm going to encourage you, if you have not heard it, to listen to the message that I taught Sunday night at Calling in the Lost. The title is God at War dash D-Day. Now, I know I will be teaching on it again uh, in even more because he's still giving me more on it. It's a vision that unfolded, and, and my job is to pray and write and deliver those things. Now, we may even get into some of it again tonight. But tonight, listen, when he, if he's going to wake me up at 3.30 in the morning and give me the lesson, you're going to sit here and listen to it. I'm <laughs> I had to get up at 3.30 in the morning. Get my phone, and I didn't write everything, but I had to make notes, speak into my phone, and make some notes so I could preach this tonight. So, like I said, I'm pretty sure I know what the message is tonight. <laughs> now, this verse in 2 Timothy, let me, let me set the stage a little bit. 2 Timothy. This is the last letter. The last words. I'm a little bit of a mess tonight. It's okay. These are the last words ever penned by the Apostle Paul. And he knew it. He knew his time had come. He knew. And he's writing this letter, the last one he'll ever write, to Timothy, which is a preacher that Paul trained, hand trained this guy. Timothy traveled with Paul. Saw everything, heard everything. And at this, at this point, Timothy is pastoring. He's a, minute, he's a pastor over the church at Ephesus. Paul is writing this letter from prison in Rome. When, when you know it's the last letter you'll ever write to your son in the Lord, your, the one you, you trained, are these words important? My God, I bet every, every syllable is measured by the Holy Ghost. 
And word has gotten to, to Timothy. He understands what's going on. He knows Paul's in prison. He knows he's about to be executed. Now, just in the natural, when your mentor, the one who trained you, and you're following in his steps, you're following Paul as Paul followed the Lord, and you find out that your mentor has been arrested and is scheduled for execution, in the natural, there's an opportunity for fear to come in. Isn't that right? I said, my goodness, if they've arrested my mentor, they've arrested Paul the apostle. They're going to put him to death. My goodness, they're going to come after me next. See, when you understand it in that light, 2 Timothy chapter 1, this verse that we use all the time, and we should, but it makes a whole lot more sense. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Timothy, don't you dare let fear enter into you. It's not God causing any fear to come because of what you've heard has happened to me. God has not given us a spirit of fear, Timothy. Hmm. But of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now notice verse 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed. Just because you heard they arrested me and they're going to put me to death. Timothy, don't you be ashamed. Don't be ashamed to testify of our Lord. Nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. According to the power of God. We're headed towards the verse, and I'll just tell you now endure hardness as a soldier. And I know that Paul wrote that to Timothy, a full-time frontline minister. Can we say it another way? A full-time five-fold, one of the five-fold minister. You say, well, should you preach that to Joe Public and Mary Wallpaper? Maybe not. But see, you're the Wednesday night crowd in this church. You are not called to be Joe Public and Mary Wallpaper. You are soldiers in the army of the Lord. You guys are, if you're anything, you're the tip of the spear going into revival. You have already survived more beatings, if you'll allow me, where the enemy has thrown everything, including the kitchen sink, trying to, by any means, buy you off, run you off, scare you off, beat you away, by any means possible, Dave used to say it, if the enemy had his way, he would, he would take all of you. And the prayer center and the name, he would, Dave used to use an SOS pad on a, on, a, on a pots and pan. You remember, you know, you got, you got a stain that won't come off, and you, what do you get? You get that SOS pad. And remember Dave, he'd go, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> you're taking that SOS pad, and you're putting pressure, and I mean, this is steel wool. And eh, eh, why? You're going you're gonna to rid that pot of that stain. And if, if the devil had his way, he would rid the earth of you. And the name of the prayer center and Dave Roberson for sure forever. Like it never existed. But you're still here. Don't tell me you're not called to be disciples. Don't tell me you're not called into the army of the Lord. You're a soldier. In this army. And Paul might as well have been writing to you. Whether you're male or female. Don't you have a spirit of fear? One of the meanings of that word is timidity. Don't you hear about what happened to me, Timothy? And start becoming timid about this gospel. Don't you get in fear. You speak it out. Going down to verse 11. There's just not time to do line by line. We'll never make it where he wants to go. <laughs> Wherefore, whereunto I am, an appoint, I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. That's Paul's calling. For the which cause, 
In other words, because I've been called to that. I'm suffering these things. In other words, I obeyed what he told me to do. We're going to look tonight at one of the, one of the requirements of a disciple is take up your cross. And part, that's not only taking up your cross to discipline the flesh. When you find out your blueprint, that's your cross. Paul's blueprint, you got it in verse 11. I am an appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. That's Paul's cross. That's his assignment. So he set about to do it in, in, in Acts to Agrippa, I think it was. He said, I did not disobey the heavenly vision. I did not disobey what he called me to do. So because he's been doing it, that's why he says in verse 12, for the which cause, because I have been doing what he called me to do, I also suffer these things. Now notice, he's in prison. Can you imagine what the devil's saying about Paul? Can you imagine what the religious Jews who persecuted him at the time, I'm not against the Jews at all, I'm just saying at that time, they were the ones that stirred up a lot of trouble against Paul. Can you imagine the glee? Finally, we're going to be rid of this guy. I can't imagine the things that were spoken against him. But notice he says, nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. And am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Now notice what he says. Notice what he says to Timothy. Timothy, hold fast the form of sound words, words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Don't you dare compromise. Just because they're about to put me to death, just because I've been arrested, Timothy, don't you get a spirit of fear. Don't you get timid. And I want you to hold fast everything I said to you. I want you to keep on teaching that exact same thing. Yeah, but if I teach that, won't they come after me? Come on down to verse 3 of chapter 2. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good what? As a good soldier. Now again, I know he's writing this to Timothy, a pastor, part of the fivefold on the front line. But I believe this verse applies to every person in the sound of my voice. Because if you're here or if you're hearing this message, I believe you're called as a soldier in the army of the Lord. I believe you're part of Joel's army. You're part of that tip of the spear that's going into revival. Amen? Well, go, now go over to Luke 14. This morning again, about 3.30 in the morning, he woke me up and went to this passage again. I saw these verses. <clears throat> and at first, we're just going to look at the three requirements let me read from my page. Jesus gave the following list of requirements that are mandatory for all who would become his disciples. In fact, let me get over there myself so I can make sure I'm telling you exactly. And we're going to pick it up in verse uh, 25. <clears throat> and there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them. Now, before we even read, Alan brought out a good point. It's important to find out who Jesus is talking to. Sometimes he said things to the 12. Sometimes he said things to uh, maybe the 70. But notice who he's talking to here. There went great what with him? Great multitudes. And he said, he turned and he said unto them. This is to everybody who wants to be a disciple. You got it? You're not, no one is excluded from this list. If you want to be his disciple, he gives three things. In verse 26, he says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, notice, yea, 
and his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. All right, that's one. That's requirement number one. Number two is verse 27. Whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. There's number two. And then all the way that he, he gives some examples. So come on down to verse 33. This is the third requirement. So likewise, whosoever be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Now, here's what happened at 3.30 in the morning. Well, first off, it was like this. And all of a sudden, ooh, he come awake. And I mean, he's talking and showing me stuff. He said, these requirements that we all read those, and we go, oh, man. Man, I don't know if I can do that. Whew. I mean, I love my family. I love my wife and my kids and my grandkids. What? You want me to do what? Oh, and my own life also, I kind of partial it too. <laughs> My cross. Nobody likes a cross, Lord. Nobody likes a cross. Anyone like a cross? I don't know anybody. Some people, I heard people tell me they like fasting. I stay away from them. No. <laughs> Although I am beginning to understand anyway. <laughs> but anyway. And then the last one. Forsake not, forsakes all that he has. Man, don't, doesn't this seem hard? It did to me. I don't have to answer. But I've always went, man, this is just, can I say, unreasonable? It's just really, really hard. And you know what he said to me? And if he said to me, these requirements are not usual at all. Every soldier in the army has to comply with all three. I went, you know, something real spiritual like, what? <laughs> what? See? Listen. So let me just start reading some things here. He started unfolding to me. Listen, when it comes to family, I'm going to, I'm going to specific, I'm not going to reference so much current day, but it's the same today. But I think about my dad. My mom and dad were married for three and a half months. My dad tried to enlist, by the way. He tried to enlist when World War II broke out. And uh, they rejected him. They 4 f him because he had a plastic disc in his back from a, an accident that had happened. But then as things got... So him and mom went ahead and got married. They weren't going to get married until he got back, but, well, I'm 4F, so they got married. Three and a half months later, after they got married, he got drafted. Because what they did, they, they needed more men, and they lowered the standards to include him. So my mom and dad were married three and a half years. My dad got drafted. To, he went to Germany. And they didn't see each other for about four years, four and a half years. Okay. My dad said I was born shortly after he got back, but that's another story. <laughs> Something about nine months and 15 minutes. But anyway, <clears throat> sorry. I'm not going to tell that in church for sure. But listen, Sue's going. <laughs> well, it's Wednesday night. I don't see any, you know. <laughs> now think about this every soldier wasn't just my dad all of, all of those men did they not have to leave family wife brothers sisters children grandchildren did they not have to do exactly that every soldier must follow the orders given to him no matter if it takes him to another continent away from friends and family. His love for his family cannot keep him from obeying his instructions as a soldier. No soldier is allowed to say, I'll be a good soldier until you try and move me away from the comfort of my wife and children. That will not work. You can't be a soldier and have that. Can you understand Jesus is, when he says, if you're going to be my disciple... You're going to be a soldier in the army of the kingdom of the Lord. There's no difference here. Every soldier does this. This is not unreasonable. 
Every soldier has to forsake friends, family, loved ones if they're called into the army. Isn't that right? All right, number two, his own life also. Well, again, every soldier in every army knows his service will be unto death if need be. Nobody wants it, but they know that's, that's the deal. Isn't that right? He can't say, he can't have this attitude and, and be a soldier. He can't say, well, I'll be a good soldier until the shooting starts. <laughs> but as soon as my life is in danger, I'm out of here. I'm going to tuck tail and run. And we have an answer for those guys. We call them deserters and we shoot them. Jesus is just saying, if you're going to be my disciple, you're going to be a soldier. And it, it's a life thing. Yes, sir. I'm reminded right now of Jin Ho Kim, my, our good friend and pastor, and his wife, Sune, over in the South Korea. And it was my honor to be able to go over there and teach for six years in a row. I just thank God I got to teach in conferences, but I also got to teach at their missionary school. They have a school where they train missionaries. Now, their, their Bible school, their, their missionary school is a little different from a lot of them because in the interview process, when you come in to interview, that you'd like to maybe be a student at that school, somewhere in the interview process, this question is asked. Now, is it your intention that if you attend this school and you graduate to become a missionary on the foreign field? Or are you just here to learn about missionary? No, no. I'm here to become an actual missionary. Okay, good. Check. Next question. Once you become a missionary, is it your desire that you are going to be a lifer and spend the rest of your life on the missionary field? Are you just wanting to go for a six months or a year or two years and then come back? What is your intention? If they say six months, a year, two years, or short term, then they say, well, we appreciate your desire to serve the Lord. Here is a list of good missionary schools that you are welcome to apply to to go attend because this school is for lifers only. And that's what Jesus is saying right here. And your own life also. Every soldier that ever went to war knows could be his own life also. Isn't that right? He doesn't get to choose where he goes. He doesn't get to choose what battlefield he doesn't get to choose even what he does during the battle. All those decisions are decided by someone higher. So when it says his own life, also every soldier knows his service is unto death if need be. Again, he can't say, I'll be a good soldier until the shooting starts. But as soon as my life is in danger, I'll turn tail and run. No. I mean, now sadly... And I don't want to be disparaging because it's, it's, it's hard. He's going to get down here in a little while to counting the cost. See, everybody, how do I say this? Everybody, anybody can talk a good game. It's one thing to talk the walk. It's a whole other thing to walk the walk. And talk is good until something you love gets threatened. See, remember that we're going to get to that tower here in a little bit. If the enemy's coming and you, you love that tower and he's going to tear your tower down, are you going to compromise in order to save your tower? Are you going to compromise to save your life? Where, where is the line where what you love is greater than your duty as a soldier? Can you get this? You see the... The requirements for the disciple are the same as the requirements for a soldier. They're the same. All right. He says, the second one is, I'll read it the way he said it. Whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Okay, let's talk about bearing the cross. Now, this one is twofold. Part of bearing that cross is that flesh you're wearing. Because Jesus didn't just die on the cross. Well, he did die on the cross once. But he died on that cross. When it comes to his flesh, he kept his flesh on the cross every day of his life. 
Because it plainly says he was tempted in all points like we are now. We read that and go, yes, yes, yes. He's, no, 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 no. He was tempted like you are. He was tempted like you are. He was tempted like you are. Nothing that ever tempted you was stronger than what tempted him. And he put his flesh on the cross every single time. God has put that same life in us. That's that new nature I'm talking about. He did it for 30 years without the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Did you get that? You want to be a soldier? You ever see a soldier go to boot camp? Come in with long hair, chubby cheeks, think they're some kind of hot rod. Boy, they, they start dismantling that real quick. First thing, they take you right to the barber. How would you like? I've seen them. I've seen it. How would you like your hair? Well, I could part it on this side, and I'd like about a half inch off. Okay, good. Is that okay? Just a minute. Get the shears. <laughs> right down to the skin. <laughs> just, just all that pride and all that. I, I think I'm something that's gone real quick. And before it's over, everything you thought you were good at, you find out you weren't good at nothing. Anyway, what I'm saying is, there, oh, and you may become in a little soft and, you know, like Gary, you know, you're kind of a teddy bear, you know, kind of soft. Yes, I'm, I'm huggable and squeezable and, you know, yes, Sue says, yes, I are. That's my girlfriend right there. Anyway, <laughs> well, that's not okay for a soldier. They start putting you as a soldier through physical discipline. Push-ups. I didn't sign up for no doggone push-ups. <laughs> what? Running before dawn. What? And where's the snicker bars? Where's the lattes? Oh. <laughs> where's the chicken pot pie? <laughs> Fried chicken. Oh, anyway, we're going to be going. It's fasting season. <laughs> what vegetables you want me to eat vegetables what every soldier goes through a cross of discipline when it comes to their flesh and get this it is not optional you don't get to go that's fine for Nathan <laughs> but not for moi no Every soldier, every disciple must take up their cross and follow him. He took up his cross when it came to his flesh, and he kept his flesh under dominion every single day. And we are told to walk as he walked. Whew. So I wrote here, bearing the cross is twofold. Boot camp for the flesh, hard training, exercise, restricted diet, we're called to endure hardness as a soldier. We're called to get tough. Now get this. Spiritually. Mentally. Emotionally. And physically. Hmm. Do you hear all those amens cascading through the building? Mm-hmm. That's part of bearing your cross. Taking up your cross. It's going to be hard on the flesh. For us, it includes, that for us, us, disciples. We, we use terminology like this. It's called mortifying the deeds of the body. Daily overcoming sin. I'll tell you one more. Daily obeying the voice of the Holy Ghost. People, when they come to the prayer center, always have the same problem. What is your problem, sir? What's your problem, ma'am? My problem is I can't hear God. Okay? Epoxy your britches right here to one of these chairs. Listen to these tapes by Dave Roberson. Tapes. Listen to these messages. <laughs> Begin praying in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit. Start doing the things. And about six months later, you're going to have a bigger problem. Well, what's your problem now? I heard God. And you're not going to believe what 
what you said to me. Yeah, I probably will. Probably bigger than you, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're wishing you fasted back then. Now, aren't you? No, anyway. <laughs> When you're on the front line, it's not the time to start doing your push-ups. That's a good sentence right there. I want revival. When you're on the front lines, that's not the time to start your discipline. Mm. Fasting is good boot camp. It's good training for disciples, spiritual soldiers. But now, that cross is twofold. There's that part about discipline, the, the flesh, keeping the flesh on the cross. But the other side of that coin is your assignment. See, Jesus had an assignment none of us have. He, he's the only one that was qualified to die physically on that cross for the sins of the world. With, trust me, no one else is ever going to have that same assignment. There's only one. But we are the body of Christ, and each one of us is part of his body. Just like my body right now has lungs and a heart and a pancreas and all these different parts. They're all doing what they're supposed to be doing so that the body can function here. That's us. And every blessed one of us has a part to play in the body. You will never figure it out. Only the Holy Ghost knows that. Thank God for Pastor Dave teaching us how you can find that out. I love it. I love it how, how many have said it, but Nathan especially. Dave said it first, though. I'm not taking anything away from Dave. Listen, if you continually, faithfully, regularly pray in the Spirit, you will not miss your calling. Even if you never hear, yeah, yeah, thou art a zama zama. Thou shalt goest thereeth and doest thiseth. <laughs> he may. He can do that. He can show visions and dreams. He can. But the thing of it is, his leadership for you will grow like a tree. Remember Dave teaching us that? You re regularly, repeatedly, like a good soldier, report to the prayer closet, praying what you don't know to pray. You don't know what your calling is, but the Holy Spirit, he makes intercession for you according to the will of God. He knows the plan. And it'll grow in you like a tree. I, I'll never forget the day I heard Dave. Dave. Never forget the day I heard Nathan talking about. Man, he didn't want to leave Texas. Are you kidding? That's where Lori was. Come on. He didn't want to leave Texas. Young man in love with Lori. You ever seen Lori? No, no wonder he didn't want to leave. Come on. <laughs> I'm getting the glory hand. Hallelujah over here. I, I understand that completely, you know. And, and, but it kept growing and growing and growing. And he said, I'll never forget this sentence. He said, finally, the day came where it was so strong in me. I knew for me not to move to Tulsa was sin. That's the way it works. And I don't think he ever heard a voice. Thou shalt move to Tulsa. But that knowing came because he reported faithfully to the closet. That knowing will come in you. If you're a good soldier and report faithfully to the closet, let me, let me just give you a little heads up. The Holy Spirit will not fail you. Now, did you get that? The Holy Spirit, I'm going to give you one more for good measure. The Holy Spirit is smarter than you are dumb. Trust me, he can get it across even to you. Yeah. He can, and he will, because that's what he's been sent here to do. Hmm. So I'll put the second part of bearing your cross is, that's your assignment in the army. It's your, you could say your assignment as a disciple. What is it he's called? Remember, I love how, how Saul of Tarsus, when he had that vision on the road to Damascus, why persecutest thou me? And I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. And, and boy, Saul had the two best statements. I mean, he said, who are you, Lord? No, he didn't know who it was even. He said, but whoever you are, you're Lord. Well, I'm Jesus. Okay, he found that out. And then the second thing was the perfect question. Lord, what would you have me do? There it is. Your life is not your own anymore. What does the word Lord mean to you? He is Lord. You are not. <laughs> Hmm. 
So it's your assignment in the army. It's your assignment. That cross is your assignment in the body of Christ. Around here we would use the terminology, it's your blueprint. It includes not only that knowledge that grows in you like a tree, it would include prophecies. Because they're going to be in line with that. If it's really a pro real prophecy. But you've got to remember, soldiers do not decide where they are assigned. Soldiers don't get to pick the missions that they go on. Soldiers, once they receive their orders, they salute smartly and they proceed to do the orders that they were given. That's a good soldier. I'm thinking of Paul and Silas right now. They didn't know what to do. They had finished up their assignment and they were thinking about going to uh, Asia and the Holy Spirit suffered them not. Okay. Well, uh, how about Bithynia? Maybe we need to go to Bithynia. Bunch of heathen over there. I'm sure they need the gospel. But again, the Holy Spirit forbade it. They had to wait till they got their orders. And then the orders came. And you know that story about the call over into Macedonia. Okay, I'm not going to preach on that tonight. I'm going to read that last one again. It says, soldiers salute smartly and follow orders. The next one is, even if those orders will result in death. Like death on a cross did for Peter. You see why our church is just busting at the seams, everybody clamoring to get in here? They will eventually. But only if we make it to discipleship. How about this last one? The third one. So likewise, it's verse 30, Luke 14, 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Well, forsaking all that he has. My dad was a carpenter by trade and by name. When he got drafted by the army, what do you think happened with his carpentry business? Well, that's over. Think about World War II. I wrote down butchers and bakers and candlestick makers. <laughs> and it does not matter. All were drafted as soldiers into World War II. All of those new recruits had to forsake their businesses, their occupations, their houses, and their lands in order to fulfill their duties as soldiers. See, you can't be a soldier in the army and go, I'll be a good soldier until the economy goes bad. Then I'm bailing. I'll be a good soldier. I'll serve. Well, unless my business gets in trouble. Let's, let's read the middle part now that I didn't read before. Luke 14, look at verses 28 through 32. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Now let's keep it, let's keep it in the context. He's talking about being a disciple. This tower would be whatever he's assigned you to do. Isn't that right? Yeah. Lord, you want me to build this? You want me to do this? Jesus is comparing that to building a tower. He says, well, which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it will begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king? And notice Jesus himself was making a comparison here between discipleship and war. Soldiers. Get it? What king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consults whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that comes against him with 20,000. Now, now, look at me for a minute. You have 10,000 soldiers. You have been given an assignment. You, uh, you have 10,000 soldiers with you, but where he's assigning you, the enemy's going to come with 20,000. 
Does that look promising to you? <laughs> Looks like death, doesn't it? You got what it takes to finish? You going to compromise when it gets hard? You going to compromise when it looks like certain death? What king goes to war, make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consults whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that come against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is yet a great way off. In other words, I can see how this is going to turn out. He sends an ambassage and desires conditions of peace. What is Jesus teaching here? If you want to be my disciple, know that you are enlisting as a soldier in the kingdom of heaven. It is war. It is the invasion of light into darkness. Jesus intends for his soldiers. Remember he says, Upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And usually we're taught, Oh, the gates of hell. That's the counsels of hell coming after you. And the Holy Spirit asked me one day, Tell me about all the times in your life when you got attacked by a gate. Never been attacked by no gate. Now I know there's counsels. You could preach that. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about prisoners of war. That what we see in Acts 10.38, everywhere Jesus went, he saw these people that had been bound by Satan. They're like prisoners of war behind the gate. Satan's got them locked up. Satan's got them blind, bent over for all those years. Women with issue of blood, blind people, deaf people, everything in the world. And he says, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. He's called us as, as the army of the Lord to go kick the gate down and set every captive free. We're not supposed to be timid about it and fearful about it. We need to go into our boot camp praying in the Spirit. Yes, fasting, the Word, worship, doing everything we know to do so that we're good soldiers, soldiers of the cross in Jesus' name. That's called revival in our generation. Alan was, oh, he was on fire Sunday. Now, Alan's gentle, but Alan was on fire. Uh, boy, when he said this, I'm telling you, it just pierced right through me. I knew it was true. He said, listen, for 2,000 years, since the book of Acts, the devil has, now there's been, little, there's been revivals, but not the kind we're talking about, where you know you can take your blind child on any day to that revival, and that child will come back seeing. That's the kind we're called to. Say it with me. First time. First time. Every, time. Every time. No exceptions. No exception. That's the way it was with Jesus. Isn't that right? He's calling us to that same thing. You, 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 see, you see what we're talking about? Now, there is no turning back. This fight is unto death. Jesus went and kicked the gates down everywhere he went. Remember that woman bowed over? He said, should not this woman who has, whom Satan hath bound, prisoner of war. Wasn't it 18 years or 12? Anyways, a whole bunch of years. Any of them too long. Satan hath bound. Shouldn't she be free? Who set her free? Jesus set her free. We're supposed to go in. He says, the works that I do shall you do also. We are supposed to be doing exactly the same thing and bless God we're getting there. We are going to have this revival I'm to where you guys, now this is not going to be a one-man show. This is Joel's army. It's been prophesied in this last day. Every one of you, from the least to the greatest, every one of you is going to be able to go in, kick the gate down, and set every captive free. Because we're good soldiers. We're good disciples. So Jesus is teaching, if you want to be my disciple. You need to know up front that you're enlisting as, an, as a soldier in the army of the kingdom of heaven. It is war. It is the invasion of light into darkness. We are to kick down every gate of hell where people are being held captive in strongholds of darkness. We, Jesus said to heal the sick. Didn't say pray for the sick. I'm so tired of praying for the sick. 
I'm trying to get that out of my mind. Not once did he command me to pray for the sick. He said for me to heal the sick. Cast out devils. He didn't say try it. He said cast them out. Know what you're doing. Cleanse the leper and raise the dead. Glory to God. So Jesus is saying count the cost because now listen. There is no turning back. Remember that time he said he that puts his hand to the plow and then looks back. He's not fit for the kingdom of God. I'd know what that meant for the longest time. I do now. Man, when you're going into the kingdom of God, you're going in as a soldier unto death. We are lifers. Say it with me. I am a lifer. I am a li I'm, 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 in the, I'm in the war for the rest of my life. My life belongs to you, Jesus. I am a lifer. There is no turning back. Lord, I am a lifer. This fight is unto the death. And this is not a skirmish. This is total war. Amen. You see this? So in my mind, I'm seeing these old newsreels. Sue used to say, uh, I mean, I, I have studied Hitler so much in my lifetime because to me it's fascinating how God can use one man. You do know that Germany was a Christian nation for hundreds of years. Martin Luther was a German for crying out loud. The, the Protestant Reformation. And they were steeples and churches and Christian people for generations, many generations. The enemy was able to raise up one man. One man. And through this, not only twist him and get him so demonically programmed, but this man was able to turn a whole nation of Christians, for the most part, to the point, you, if you ever tour, tour Auschwitz and Birkenau and see the pictures and walk through those places, there's still a spirit of grieving there. I'm telling you, we, Sue and I had the privilege, it's an absolute privilege, and we feel like we're walking on sacred ground. But they didn't have plastic back then. They, they got a two-story building that's, they, that's got a glass partition. And behind that partition is wire rim glasses. They didn't have plastic. All of them were wire rim in those days. And that thing's filled. Adult-sized glasses. Children-sized glasses. Almost to the, for two stories high. Way taller than you are. They got another one that's full of shoes. Baby shoes. Worn out shoes. New shoes. High heel shoes. Low heel shoes. Even some wooden shoes. Another one was luggage of all kinds. With names written on them. And all kinds of luggage. And that's at Auschwitz, which Auschwitz is really where they learned how to do it. There was only two small crematoriums there. We got, to, we got to walk through one. I got to look right into that chamber where they burned them. But Birkenau is about five, six miles down the road. Birkenau is where the, Auschwitz is where they learned how to do it. Auschwitz is where they really did it. And over there they had two giant crematoriums already functioning and they were building two more right near the end of the war. When you stand in Birkenau, you walk out into the middle of it and you stand there and you look to the right and you look to the left. Birkenau is so big, it disappears over the horizon. Huge. Many of those barracks are still standing. They had big plans. They had big plans. It was already bad enough, but they were serious about exterminating the Jews and the gypsies and so many. One man. All of this flowed from Satan through the mind of one man. So I've studied, I've studied, and Sue, Sue used to tease me saying, you need an all Hitler, all the time channel. Because <laughs> anything would come on, Hitler this, Hitler that, I'd record, record. But I'd study, and I've studied, see. Now, and I've, I've seen all of those news reels. I don't know that there's any I've never seen from World War II. So I'm going to finish with this for tonight. See, in my mind, while I was typing this today, not at 3.30 in the morning, later in the day, 
In my mind, I began seeing those old newsreels of London during World War II as the bombing raids continued day after day. Have y'all ever seen those black and white newsreels? And remember seeing Churchill in that long black coat and that cane that he had? And he, he was kind of stooped, you know. He'd, and he'd walk. And I also seen him where the king and the queen would go out. And there's rubble. It's London, but they've been bombed, man. There's rubble, rubble. But they would perfectly go out during the daytime where the people could see them to encourage them so that they not give up, not despair. So the way I wrote it, I said, I see Churchill walking with his cane through the streets of rubble, encouraging the Londoners not to give up and surrender. In his famous speech, when it appeared all was lost, Winston Churchill said, Never give in. Never give in. Never, 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 never. In nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in except to the convictions of honor. Never yield to force and never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. Another speech, we will fight them in the fields. We will fight them on land. We will fight them from the rivers. But we will never surrender. Now, I know those are earthly examples, but Jesus says, count the cost. I'm not sending you in to lose. I'm sending you in to win. But this is total war. There is no compromise. There is no turning back. Not for love of family or love of house or home or anything else. This is total war. And we will never surrender. Last paragraph. Jesus is saying count the cost. If there is anything you love. More than victory in the kingdom of God. You will eventually compromise. Because that thing you love will be touched by the enemy. The enemy is going to use everything he can. And he's going to touch whatever it is you love more than Jesus. You better count the cost. You better count it now. Because it is time to go to war as good soldiers of the cross. Can I get an amen? Oh, hallelujah. I encourage you to listen to Sunday night's message. If you don't listen to it, it's okay. You're going to hear it again. <laughs> Well, because he's still, he's still, I'm only going to mention one name. I could mention many. Pastor Dave, Rosalie. Faithful. Did what they love get touched? When I think of the thousands of people, I've been here 25 years roughly, when I see the thousands, when I think of the thousands, literally I don't think that's an exaggeration, the thousands of people that have come, be seen them too over the years, excited about the message, we're with you until Jesus comes. Uh -huh. Until they started doing the discipline, the boot camp stuff of actual prayer and actual fasting. And they start getting into those emotional wars and a lot of them got took out, I think, before the enemy ever got to them. Just their own emotions took them out. But some of them, the enemy would come and touch some. Well, that's it. I didn't sign up for this. You, know, you signed up for blessing. You didn't sign up for war. But see, those of it, and I'm not, I'm just saying, if you're still here, and I know that your stuff has been touched. <laughs> Your emotions have been touched. Your family probably. Other things. You're still here. God bless you. You are soldiers of the cross. God bless you. Now let's go ahead and finish this. Let's, that blueprint. Get in there and pray like a crazy person. Let that direction grow in you like a tree. Then the Holy Spirit, as you begin taking your steps of obedience, the Holy Spirit will add His power. 
And you will accomplish what Jesus called you to do. And we are going into revival and all hell can't stop it. Thank God for faithful people. I am trying to quit. In Jesus' name I quit. <laughs> I'm just quitting the message, not the war. Hallelujah. Did you get anything out of that? It's that thing that I've, for years, I thought, oh, these are really hard. Man, these are really hard. Every soldier has to do exactly those things. Every, it's not hard. This is normal for a soldier. We just haven't had the mindset of a soldier. But every soldier has to do exactly those same three things. All of them. Hallelujah. We're good soldiers. I quit, really. <laughs> In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. It's a good thing because I just lost my train of thought. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, really, you're dismissed. Thank you, Lord. Now, go down. Don't stay. Really, I'm going, to, I'm going to end up the way I started. This is, this is, we're in fasting season. We're not playing around. If you're not doing something every day, start tomorrow. Miss a meal or two. Do something. Do something that your flesh doesn't like. Okay, restrict it. Put it in boot camp. Just, just do something. Skip breakfast. Skip pie after lunch. Something. <laughs> but it would be better if you could do a lot more than that. Amen. Hallelujah. Put pressure. Let's, let's go to boot camp. This is a good thing. All right. Really, I quit. 